it isn't just somebody else's problem because I think it's very e easy to think of it a bit like that especially when we focus on misconduct so probably the best estimate we have of the actual frequency or incidence of misconduct which was a systematic review done by Daniele Fanelli a few years ago um, he found that while 2% of scientists actually admitted quite serious misconduct. Um, there are some interesting methodological problems with this study because, of course, why would people admit this and they were only looking at fabrication and falsification. They weren't looking at other types of misconduct. But the, the point I want to make here is while 2% actually admitted committing misconduct themselves, 14% of scientists said that they were aware of misconduct by others. Now, this could simply be a sort of arithmetic uh, fluke that, of course, if there's a famous case of misconduct in your institution, more people know about it than actually commit it. But I think it also is an underlying issue that we tend to focus on the sort of big, major types of misconduct, things like fabrication, falsification, things that end up with retractions on retraction watch, and we don't always think about the so-called questionable practices or perhaps more minor things, which actually may have a more serious effect on the literature. And I think one of the difficulties of thinking about uh, fraud and misconduct, sorry, could someone mute their mic? I'm getting some noises. I'm getting some funny background noises at the moment. Thank you, that's better. So, actually defining what we mean by misconduct is really quite difficult. On the far right-hand side of the slide, it, it's very clear to see the obvious cases. So if you take a whole article, you retype it, you put someone up, your, your own name on it, and you submit it to another journal, that's obviously deliberate fraud, and everyone would see that as plagiarism. But if you take a few words from somebody else's paper, and you maybe don't pa paraphrase it very cleverly, perhaps because you're not so fluent in the language you're writing in, does that count? Similarly, we know that there are lots of problems with poor statistical analysis, and that can end up probably with misleading results. But we tend not to think of that as a case of misconduct, although it can have just, uh, you know, just as much harmful effect. We also know that many studies are underpowered or they have weak methods, and uh, I'm going to show you a few examples from preclinical work. So it's quite difficult to know what we really mean by this. So I tend to focus more on research integrity. And I think the good thing about focusing on that is it doesn't matter uh, what the person's motivation was. So misconduct usually has some kind of uh, element of being deliberate. You are trying to cheat. You're trying to uh, fool people. Uh, research integrity, though, is about anything that could potentially make results unreliable or misleading, even if that wasn't your intention in the first place. So even if you had good intentions, but maybe weak methods. So while it's easy to condemn the clear abuses, um, we have to remember that these are really conventions, and that we need to understand those rules and conventions, and we don't immediately, as small children, know necessarily what we're meant to do. So when did you learn that copying a sentence instead of paraphrasing it might be counted as plagiarism? In many parts of the world, it's still very common for the head of department to go onto every paper, despite the fact that we have lots of guidelines that say this is guest authorship. How much can you tidy up your digital images and make them look a bit cleaner and neater? When does that actually become data falsification? And how many conflict of interest do you need to disclose? Uh, what about academic interests or personal links? Quite hard sometimes to judge about those. So I think research integrity is not simply about following a recipe. We can't have a very clear state of rules that says copy this number of words and that is plagiarism. It's much more about a state of mind. It's much more about taking responsibility for our actions. I like to think a very simple definition of ethics is about thinking who might get hurt by what you're doing. And so publication ethics relates to other researchers. It might relate to authors and reviewers. 
Um, it might relate to behavior by peer reviewers or by editors, but is everybody taking responsibility and thinking who might get hurt. Another reason why it's quite tricky is that defining what is and isn't good practice, you need to really keep up to date with current techniques. I couldn't look at a, a paper in you know, a very technical subject that was outside my area of expertise and know whether this was a routine uh, technique, whether this was something that required a lot of novel work, how reliable it might be, and so on. Uh, so you need judgment and understanding of the context. Just a simple example, I've mentioned the difficulty of defining plagiarism already. So if you look for some phrases, uh, very standard phrases that we're really familiar with seeing in medical articles, such as P less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. If you put that into Google, and uh, you put quotation marks around it so you get the exact phrase, you get over half a million hits. If you put it in Google Scholar, even that exact phrase, you get over 70,000 hits. Now, are we saying that that's plagiarism? A lot of the text matching software that the journals now use to screen for similar text uses strings of five or six words. Well, we've got five or six words here, but no one is suggesting that that's plagiarism. You know, this study was performed according to the Declaration of Helsinki. That gets over 400,000 hits. The difference here, though, is that these are not original phrases. We don't know who said them in the first place, and you're certainly not going to be criticized for reusing them again or not paraphrasing them. But that means that we need to have an understanding of the kind of phrases that get used, where things come from, and so on. But if you took even that small number of words from a very original source, so if I said to you, it's been a hard day's night, most of you, I think, will recognize the original authors of that. They'll know where it came from. They'll know that it's original. So it's very different, the context of the copying gets even harder when we think about reusing our own words, which is sometimes referred to as self-plagiarism. I prefer the term redundant publication or text recycling when we're just looking at text rather than uh, data. So if you do a literature review and then five years later you do an update, well, of course, you're going to include the original material that you included in the first review. So there is going to be some overlap. Is that wrong? Is that unethical? I don't think so. Let's say you do a study and you measure, oh, I don't know, air pollution, and you study Paris and you study Berlin. You, of course, should use standard methods, otherwise the results won't be comparable. Uh, does that mean you have to use different words to describe the methods even though they are the same? If you use a research database, say a cancer registry or some other big medical database, there's probably a good standard way of describing it, which will also describe its limitations, where the data come from, and that sort of thing. Do we expect to use different words every time? If you cite the same study in several of your articles, you know, there may be a pivotal study by somebody else that you want to mention in your discussion section. Um, do you have to use different words each time you do that? When you start an article and you have a statistic, you know, something like one in 12 women will suffer from breast cancer or something like that, are there different ways of saying it? So I think context is very important. I also think that if we focus on the big things like fabrication and falsification, we actually uh, perhaps overlook the so-called minor problems, which actually may have a bigger cumulative effect than the so-called major fraud. And I want to give you a few examples from preclinical research, particularly looking at the problem of underpowered, so small studies, and selective reporting. So this was a big um, meta-analysis of studies of a particular uh, preclinical model looking at fluid resuscitation. And they found that the average number of animals in each treatment group was 13. And they actually found that no trial was large enough to reliably detect a 10% difference in the risk of death, which seemed like a pretty you know, small and reasonable thing to look at. Um, 
in animal studies as well, there's often either poor design or poor reporting. Uh, in a big meta-analysis, over a thousand publications, again looking at animal models, this time models of multiple sclerosis, uh, they found that only 9% reported random allocation of the animals. Only 16% had blinded assessment of outcome. Now we know that uh, there are both conscious and subconscious effects of knowing which uh, treatment group either patients or animals are in. And that's a very simple thing that you can often do, uh, and yet it wasn't being done. And coming back to this question of power and sample size, less than 1% reported a sample size calculation. Here is some further evidence that these effects that we know about, partly from clinical studies, also have a big effect on animal studies. So uh, they took the studies that had been uh, randomized and compared them with those that weren't. And they looked at the effect sizes. And you can see um, that the effect sizes were larger in the studies that didn't randomize than those that did. They looked also at a similar effect on whether the people reviewing the outcome or rating the assessment were blinded to the treatment group. Again, you can see that the group that had did not have blinded assessment tended to give a larger estimate of the effect size than those that were properly blinded. And then the graph on the right-hand side, you can see that the number of animals in the group was correlated with the effect size. So you tend to get larger effects in smaller groups, suggesting that you're actually just getting effects by chance. There may be a more fundamental question as well that the study actually asks the wrong question. So um, this is a cumulative meta-analysis. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but this takes all the studies that, uh, that have been done on a particular topic. In this case, it's the effect of tranexamic acid on blood loss during surgery. They look at every single study and they look at the estimate of effect and the confidence interval around it. And you usually start with quite a wide confidence interval, uh, as you can see, and then it tends to get smaller as you add the results of each study into it. And the important thing is when the uh, effect size and the confidence intervals clearly pass over the line of no difference, which is the vertical line shown here. And you can see that by 2001, we had a clear indication that actually this treatment was effective in reducing blood loss. So an interesting ethical question, why then, if we knew the treatment worked, did we carry on for another 10 years doing studies that probably exposed patients to placebo or to um, a, some kind of inferior treatment when we actually knew it worked? Going back, though, although we had all these studies that were actually um, unnecessary, we, the studies were actually too small to show whether tranexamic acid also reduced heart attacks and death. So we already knew it stopped bleeding, but we didn't know whether that had further knock-on effects. So we carried on doing small studies that even when we put them together didn't really explain probably the more important questions uh, that people wanted to know. Moving on again to clinical research, uh, I know several of you are looking at, at spin and selective reporting and so on, and this is I think a really big problem. So this was one of the early studies by Anwen Chan in uh, Canada, and they looked at about 100 studies. They took the protocols that had been uh, approved by a research ethics committee, and they compared them with the articles that appeared in the medical journals. And they, looked at, they counted up all the outcomes that were mentioned in the protocols and found that about half of them were missing in the publications, and perhaps worryingly, the uh, safety outcomes were more often missing than those relating to efficacy. It wasn't just a sort of random effect either. They found that if the outcome reached statistical significance, it was more likely to get reported. And very worryingly, they found 62% of trials had at least one primary outcome that was changed between the protocol and the final report. Now, of course, I'm sure you're all aware the primary outcome is what is the main question of interest of the study. It gets approved by the Ethics Committee. It is what the power calculation is based on. So you really can't think of a good reason 
why you would change this and report on something different. We know that a lot of research is never published. I think it has improved over the last probably five or ten years, but it's still a big problem. So this study goes back a few years now, but I think it's still worth looking at. Um, so they looked at studies that had been registered on clinicaltrials.gov between 2000 and 2007, and they then looked to see how many of them had been published. And they found some slight variations depending on the size of the study and the phase in the drug design. But overall, they found that around half of studies were not published. So I think there are a lot of things that can go wrong that can make the medical literature unreliable. And publication ethics is about all those things that relate to publication. I think it's a subset, really, of research ethics. So I've mentioned already things like inappropriate analyses, unethical designs, and so on. Uh, obviously, they tend to happen while the research is being done. They occur before it gets submitted to the journal. Publication ethics tends to be the things that are really only come to light when something is submitted to a journal. So what can go wrong? Fabrication is when someone actually makes up the data. It doesn't occur at all. There's no research, um, but they just simply make it up. So it's probably the most extreme form. I would say it's also pretty rare, but it certainly does occur sometimes. Falsification is where you get some results, but you don't really like them. So you change them a bit, and uh, maybe you miss out some outliers, or you do a wrong analysis, and you give a misleading presentation. Selective reporting is where you get some results and you just don't report the ones that you don't like. Um, we can, of course, have misleading authorship, where people who didn't really get involved with the work are listed. Those are the so-called guest authors. Or people who were involved and should properly have been credited are left off, and those are the ghosts. Uh, mentioned already stealing other people's work. Doesn't have to be words. Could be figures or ideas, which is plagiarism. Publishing the same data more than once, which is redundant publication, sometimes known as salami slicing, and not really explaining things like the funding, the interests of the authors, and things that readers would like to know, and that's conflict of interest or lack of transparency. I want to focus on four of those topics that today. I want to think about plagiarism, redundant publication, undeclared conflict of interest, and authorship problems. So. I've mentioned that it's quite difficult to define plagiarism, but actually it's quite easy to avoid it. So first of all, if you refer to somebody else's work or you're influenced by somebody else's work, always reference it. However, referencing it isn't enough. If you copy more than a few words from anybody else's publication, uh, you need to put them in quotation marks as well as referencing them. Make it very clear that you have taken the exact words. Plagiarism and copyright overlap to some extent, and if you want to use a figure or table from another publication, you need to get permission from the copyright holder. In many cases, that's the publisher. Sometimes it's the author. It does vary on the way that the publication is produced. Uh, so it sometimes means that you may need to get permission to reproduce your own work uh, if the publisher actually holds the copyright. Ethically speaking, there isn't a rule against plagiarizing your own work, which is why I don't really like the term self-plagiarism, but there are conventions about redundant publication. So redundant publication, strangely, seems to have a lot of synonyms. It's often referred to as duplicate publication, especially in the US and North America. I personally am a bit pedantic. To me, a duplicate is an exact copy, and also duplicate suggests just two whereas we know that there may be multiple copies, uh, whereas I think redundant is probably more descriptive. Overlapping publication is quite a helpful description because there may be some new bits and some old bits. It's rare for the whole article to be exactly the same. I've mentioned already that some people use the term self-plagiarism. I personally don't like it because I think plagiarism is always wrong. Failing to credit other people's work is always unethical. However, repeating your own words may sometimes be unavoidable. And again, the word comes from a Greek word meaning to steal or to kidnap. You can't really steal your own possessions, so I don't think it's such a good term. 
Text recycling is generally used to refer to repeats of text but not data, so it's seen as a sort of um, a more minor form of, of redundant publication. And I mentioned already salami slicing. This is usually where you take one big study and you slice up the data very finely so you can get multiple publications. So the motivation is to get more publications for your CV rather than to have one big uh, useful publication. So, what is and isn't acceptable in terms of multiple presentations of results? So, you can present things at meetings and conferences, in other words, talks and posters, before the full publication. That is not considered to be redundant. There's no limit on the number of abstracts you can present at meetings, as long as the conferences allow it. So, some of the big meetings only want you to present new data. Smaller, national or regional ones tend to be more relaxed, so you just need to check the requirements. You do need to be careful with translations and check the copyright, but generally they're okay as long as the source is acknowledged and you've got permission from the original publisher and the new publisher. You shouldn't present it as if it were a completely new piece of work. And sometimes there'll be legitimate things like follow-up, secondary analyses and so on. It's often common that one piece of work generates more than one publication, but in that case you need to make it really clear that these are secondary analyses and you should reference the original publication and ideally also put in um, a re trial registration number to make it really clear that these data both derive from the same study. So some simple rules to avoid redundant publication, check the journal and conference guidelines, there's some really helpful guidance in ICMJE, that's the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Have a look on their website if you're not familiar with it. They talk a lot about um, redundant and overlapping publication. Uh, if you're not sure, seek permission from a publisher to reuse or translate material. If you are producing multiple articles from a single set of data, send a copy of a linked publication or of a manuscript in with your submission when you submit to another journal. That way the editor can make their own mind up. They might advise you and say, well, as you've published some of this before, perhaps you can cut down a bit on the detail of the methods, make sure that it's clearly cross-referenced and so on. I also advise mentioning any previous or linked publications in your cover letter uh, to make it really clear that you're being transparent with the journal. Another aspect of transparency is really understanding who funded the work, where the author is coming from, what their personal interests are. I like this definition from the World Association of Medical Editors, WAMI, of conflict of interest. And the reason I like it particularly is it puts the emphasis not so much on the author, but on the reader. So it says conflict of interest exists when there's a divergence between somebody's private interests and their responsibilities to scientific and publishing activities such that a reasonable observer might wonder if the individual's behavior or judgment was motivated by considerations of his or her competing interests. So it's not whether you feel that you are biased, it's not whether you, you know, think that you've been affected by a particular relationship um, or by funding, it's what a re reader might expect to understand. We tend to focus on financial interests, but they're not the only ones. Uh, so obviously, you should disclose things like share ownership, employment, uh, payments by companies that stand to either uh, benefit or lose from a publication. Uh, but competing, competing interests in terms of, say, peer review could relate to personal links, so working in the same department, having worked to somebody somebody's supervisor or student. I just give a little example here, you know, if you received a paper to peer review and you found it was by your ex-wife or your ex-husband, perhaps the editor would like to know that. Uh, there may be other things if you're working in the fields of, say, abortion or end-of-life care, alcohol or drug use, your religious uh, or political views might come into play. And so it's really thinking what the reader might want to know. So it's not about whether you think you are biased, it's about what readers and editors feel they need to know. And if in doubt, always best to disclose rather than not. My last theme is authorship. Now this is something that I really recommend you start thinking about you know, at the beginning of your research projects, and now is the time to think about authorship. 
because authorship of scientific research is not straightforward. It's not like writing a poem or a song where the person who did the writing is clearly the author and that's all we have to worry about. Even in medicine, we had some very big studies. Here was one with over a thousand hospitals and 41,000 patients and it had 972 authors. It gets even worse in the world of physics. This is one of the papers from the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and you can see here that we're listed alphabetically. We've started with Dr. Ard. We've only got down to Dr. Baus there, if you've got keen eyesight. It carries on going all the way through the alphabet, ending with Dr. Zitracek at the bottom there. Nearly 3,000 authors. Now, I should point out, I think physics has slightly different criteria for authorship. In physics, any technical contribution to an experiment qualifies you to be an author. You don't have to have an active part in the publication. But in medicine, we have the authorship criteria from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Um, and nearly all medical journals and most institutions refer to these criteria. So it's good to be familiar with them right from the start. There are now four criteria. The fourth one was actually added three years ago in 2013. So to be an author, you've got to meet all four. So first of all, you've got to have made a substantial contribution to some part of the research. It could be the design, could be data acquisition, could be analysis or interpretation. So you've got to be actively involved in the research. The second criterion, you must be actively involved in the publication. So they suggest drafting the work or revising it critically for important intellectual content. So not just doing a language edit or not just looking at it and saying, oh, it looks okay to me, but actually really putting a intellectual input. You need to give approval of the version that's going to be submitted and published. You should never have your name on something and not be aware that your name is on it or feel unhappy at being listed as an author. And finally, all authors have got to take some accountability. And this really, I think, is where editors got fed up that if there were any problems after publication, they would contact the corresponding author and, uh, the, and say, you know, could you give some more information about this? And the standard response was always, oh, no, that, that wasn't anything to do with me. That was somebody else. So we're not saying that you have to take responsibility for other people's work, but you need to take accountability overall and make sure that any queries, any questions that arise afterwards are resolved. So those four things, but I think the first two particularly important, an active role in the research and an active role in the publication. So inappropriate authorship is where people who don't meet the criteria are listed. So it might be a senior person, might be a friend, might be somebody who you think misguidedly, I have to say, but you think might help to get the work published if you put their name onto it. Those are known as gift or guest or honorary authors. Ghost authors are people who are who do meet the qualification and are left off. It's a bit different from a ghost writer. So a ghost writer is generally somebody who's brought in to uh, write, say, the autobiography of a footballer or a modeler, model. Um, you do get professional writers involved with publications, particularly those coming from uh, the pharmaceutical industry, but they're not ghost writers because uh, they should be fully acknowledged, and they're not ghost authors because they never meet the first criterion. They haven't been involved in the research. Uh, so I think it is important to distinguish that. Obviously, it's important to acknowledge any writer uh, or translator or um, you know, someone who's helped you to prepare the manuscript, but they're not necessarily qualifying as an author, and a ghost author is somebody who did meet all the qualifications but was left off. This is a classic case of gift authorship that occurred in the UK a few years ago. Professor Geoffrey Chamberlain was the editor of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. He was also the president of the UK Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. He put his name on a paper written by a postdoc working in his department. It was an exciting paper that claimed to have reversed an ectopic pregnancy. And if it had been true, it would have been a really important surgical breakthrough. Unfortunately, it was fabricated. It wasn't true at all. But Chamberlain put his name on it, as he said, out of politeness and because he asked me to as the head of department. 
Now, while it turned out that actually the work was fabricated, of course, Chamberlain had to admit that he'd had nothing to do with the research, and he had to resign not only as the editor of the journal, but also uh, of the uh, step down as the president of the Royal College. Right at the beginning of your project is a good time to discuss authorship. Discuss everybody's expectations, see what criteria they refer to, look and see what guidance is around. Maybe your institution has some guidance. Uh, have a look at different journals. Most of them will refer to ICMJE. Um, there's very little guidance on the order of authorship, so that's something you want to think about. Um, agree the roles, the tasks that will um, qualify people to be invited to be authors and then keep a record of who does what. I put form a writing group in brackets here because that's probably more relevant for a big multi-center study. For a smaller project, you should be okay. Uh, you know, you've probably only got three or four people involved. But if you had a big multi-center study with 20 investigators, they obviously wouldn't be all sitting down to draft the uh, first draft of a publication. Um, and it's really important, as I say, to think about it early on. So there are lots of different guidelines that are available, uh, which I can recommend looking at. I'm just checking, is the sound still OK? Yes, it is. Ah. It is. Oh, good. OK, thanks. Um, so I mentioned ICMJE already. That's the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Lots of useful guidance there. Some of the individual journals have quite good guidelines. The BMJ and the Lancet, some of the big general journals, uh, PLOS Medicine has some interesting stuff there as well. If you're interested in guidance, particularly for editors, and there's some good guidance on peer review, uh, COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, and I should declare my conflict of interest that I used to chair that organization and I wrote some of the guidelines. There's a World Association of Medical Editors, and they have some useful policy statements. Um, then there are some guidelines for authors, which I was involved actually in developing. They came up at the World Conference on Research Integrity um, a few years ago, and they're available on the COPE website. Uh, if you look under guidelines, you'll find them there. They will give you some more guidance. In particular, they go beyond medicine. They're aimed at uh, all disciplines. So if you're, say, cooperating with uh, people in social sciences or information sciences, uh, you might find those useful. The publishers uh, often have useful resources. Both Wiley and Elsevier have nice details on their websites. Uh, and then anybody who's working on SPIN or working on relations with the pharmaceutical industry, I can recommend the Good Publication Practice, or GPP-3. And again, my conflict of interest that I actually started the initial GPP, and I'm an author on the uh, GPP-3 as well. Uh, you can find that on the ISMAP website. That's the International Society of Medical Publication Professionals. And then finally, although I'm sure there are some other things as well, but the one I'm going to mention now, Council of Science Editors has a really thoughtful and interesting so-called white paper on research and publication ethics. And I can recommend having a look at that. It's quite a long, it's like a, a small book, really, but it's a really good thing to read. So have a look at those. You'll find some general guidance there. So in the 40 minutes or so that we had this morning, I wanted to just give you a brief introduction. I wanted to make you, to challenge your ideas, really. So misconduct is not only about fabrication and falsification, uh, but there are other things as well. It's about good research design, good research reporting. Some other topics I haven't even covered to think of, that you might want to think about that we could either cover in a later webinar or you may find more information in other sources. That's reviewer misconduct, so when people break confidentiality or steal other people's ideas. Editor misconduct, when uh, journal editors abuse their power, for example, to favor work of family members or colleagues. Um, I know several of you are looking at SPIN and the question of commercial sponsors and how much they're involved in publications. And that's actually, actually how I got involved with publication ethics, because I used to work as a medical writer in pharmaceutical companies and uh, got interested in the whole question about when is a writer an author. Um, and what should the role of companies be in publications. Um, I mentioned data falsification and the digital images. There are lots of guidance on image manipulation. Um, copyright does overlap with ethical issues, and you need to understand it also. 
Uh, it has got quite complicated. There are these various Creative Commons licenses and so on. Uh, so it's not as simple as it used to be. Um, so you need to familiarize yourself uh, with that. And then it's not all over just after you publish. There are pub post-publication comments, things like uh, PubPeer, uh, like PubMed comment, uh, Commons and so on. And uh, so that's a sort of new area of peer review that we're really looking at and uh, does have the potential, I think, to do some, some good but also perhaps some harm as well. If you're interested, you might like to keep an eye on the Retraction Watch blog. Uh, very interesting uh, details about articles that have been retracted for various reasons, so an insight into the world of, of misconduct and problems. Uh, just to alert you to the fact that next year coming up there's a world conference on research integrity. It's going to be in Amsterdam, so quite local for some of you. Um, that's in May next year. Also next year there's the International Peer Review Congress taking place in Chicago. The deadline for abstract is going to be in the new year. I think it's usually at the end of January, so probably a bit early for submitting uh, your research, but certainly an interesting meeting to attend. Um, and the World Association of Medical Editors has a list serve um, that you can follow via their website, and that has some quite interesting discussions, so it might be worth having a look at that.